Hey kids, it's time to get some SML podcast all up in that. Uh, what's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. Joining as usual, Cole, you have audio. I have audio. Yay. Hey. He said that like he wasn't entirely sure. He was I not sure. I never know. Sure. I could be Look. like, Cole's here. <laughs> I've had a really rough two months, okay? <laughs> it's been spot. And it culminated in a full reformat of my computer. <laughs> oh, that's always the worst to happen. Yeah, because you're like unlike if you're like me, who you just suck at backing things up. Because who's got time for you know precautions when life is happening? <laughs> well, the the plus side is actually I have my operating system and, and everything else on separate hard drives. Yeah, yep. So I just unplugged my spare hard drive, okay, um, and then reformatted the operating system. But I did have to like install. Uh, all my drivers for my drawing monitor and, and my art programs and things like that. Uh-huh. <sighs> but for the some reason, reason I have to have iTunes on my internal, like on the solid state. Hmm. Every time I, I try I, to change the install path, it just defaults back to C for everything. So I just yeah. gave up and I left all my iTunes on the Oof. fucking my yeah! spirit. Give up. <laughs> Victor dropping exactly a sub. Pernell, exactly what do you think of that? For real, Pernell. I'm asking you directly. I feel like he should not be dropping subs. That's not very wholesome. He needs <laughs> to eat that sub. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's a, you know, no, never mind. There are starving children on the other side of the world who wish they had a sub, and you dropped it. <laughs> dropped it. Just dropping subs. Starving I children mean. on this side of the world that would like a sub. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Does Let's somebody not. do a charity of like feed a child? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, vaccine, and then, then, get a and then Jared Christmas. fucked that up, so uh, not quite. <laughs> Let's not use Jared and fuck in the same sentence. <laughs> oh God. Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. That's so, how's about. everyone doing? Tim, <laughs> Pernell, and Chris are here. Yeah. Well, I'm, well, I'm linking Jared and fucking a sentence apparently, so I'm not doing so hot at the moment. But I'll make it better later. I hope so. <laughs> I had my first um online, my first internet garbage pail kid trade recently, which feels nice. It's almost Ooh. like I'm a child using internet technology for childish things. <laughs> Only now. People expect you to shrink wrap a single card in like five layers of protection and then first class mail it with a tracking sticker because garbage pail kids are big money now, you know. That's Uh wild. Like people are dropping, and I'm not even making this up. I wish I were, like thousands of dollars to buy garbage pail kid cards. Dude, an original black lotus can go for 50 grand. No, 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 no. You're thinking about retro collecting. I'm talking about current releases. Like it just comes out. So oh, like takes current pictures, cards? Like, yes. Like oh, new, like, like Pokemon new, cards. Like everyone's like going new, fucking crazy about those now, too. <laughs> I, I don't get like it's it's almost like there's something like scalper time where someone's like, I know I this. Can't. I actually know the answer to this. Wait, with what? The why so if people are going crazy for garbage fill kid uh, cards, well Pokemon also has its anniversary going on, so there is that. But also like uh old video game values have like shot up in the last year. Um, and it is because people are fucking bored because they can't go <laughs> anywhere and do anything. So they're just sitting in their house collecting old shit. Well, that's the thing though. Like, I agree with that for like the retro stuff, but these are new cards. Like yeah, garbage sure. truck kids became a thing like where before it was like, Hey, here's a stack of cards. You collect 80 total and you just get them and you're done. So you can go to the store and pay like 12 bucks for a box and you're covered. Fast forward to tops reviving the product. And they started out doing that same concept. Here, you can buy one box and you have all the cards. Then they slowly started injecting chase cards into it. First, it was uh-huh. two bonus cards, then uh-huh. six bonus cards. And now we are at the point, the freaking omnibus of bullshit. It is two bonus sets of cards, as in you have to buy them only at Target and you have a Ooh. chance of getting 
24 cars amongst a set of 80 other cars oh, God. can be also acquired from any other source, but the other sources have also their own unique chase cards and it's bullshit because what you'll get is a personal line saying, here's a photo of my $10,000 or $5,000 worth of garbage for kids. Happy hunting, they call it. And then they question why Tops will say, hey, now we've got parallels, the same car, but the border's special. Like, fuck you. <laughs> fuck yeah! Like, you know, you that. say fuck you, but what does your wallet say, Purnell? No, <laughs> I'm one of the few people who don't chase them. All I want is a base set of cards. Okay. Sure. The, the, the base set. I'm kidding you not. Like, I'm already missing the freaking serial cards from this set because like, it's like they're all food themed. So there's a whole cool set of cards that are based around like serial mascots. And as you know from talking to me on this show, I fucking love serial mascots. Crossing with garbage what? kids, I would have been sold. And yet, they're special chase cards. And fuck that. I'm not chasing that junk. I'm not going out and buying $100 worth of garbage kids at Target. To get 24 cards that I actually want, maybe, and then another maybe 200 cards that I already have from a previous collection set that are now just literal garbage. But oh, wait, they're not garbage because the border might be a different color. No, they're yeah, garbage pail kids. They are literally garbage. Garbage, pale one man's kids. trash is another man's trash. You want to know what was really kids. funny hearing you say fuck at the same time that, uh, Root beer subbed and the mm -hmm. fucking yeah clip went off, so it's like fucks <laughs> in stereo from you. <laughs> fucks in space. Twenty three months, root beer. Thank you so much for the sub, though. So, now next next time uh, you gotta drop a steak. You know what they say: one man's trash is another man's garbage. Hey, all kids, hey, yo, kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love garbage folk kids. I just hate what Tops has done to the product. It, it makes me sad because I, I've officially been priced out of it. I bet. That uh, somewhere in the last year, a very famous YouTuber none of us have ever heard of or Twitch personality <laughs> opened up a bunch of garbage pail cards for his audience, like to uh, 10,000 viewers or something like that. And every single one of them are like, well, I'll get 10,000 viewers if I open up some garbage pail kid cards. I, I bet you that that's it, because that that has like such an effect now. <laughs> I actually had a friend flat out tell me, she was like, if you actually, if you did a stream where you opened your garbage pail kids, I'd watch. And my response was like, wait, why? Like, yeah. I don't understand. Dude, like, opening I, cards is fun. No, it's fun to open them watching someone else open their Drop cards. Drop it! You know, that and that's what yeah. streaming is all about. <laughs> it's like, congratulations, you got the cool card that I wish I had, but mine are still in the mail, and I'm not going to get that cool card because well, it's one of a kind. <laughs> what I understand with people who famous or like they're partnered streamers and like all they do is open Pokemon cards, like they often do giveaways. So like you could win one of those rare cards that that person just opened because mm -hmm. obviously they're not they don't care about the cards. They're just opening them for viewers. Pernell, I'm going to buy some of your cards with the 1000 biddies that Vic just donated. Holy shit. Thank hey. you, Victor. No, th thank you, Victor. I'm because spend we spend all of them on shit. garbage pail kids cards. Yeah. Yeah, hold him to that shit. I want you to buy some. I'm there dude, wondering if he can refund this. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> that bullshit. No way. <laughs> All I'm saying is, hey, I'm taking you seriously. I've got some doubles over here. Buy this shit. Give me them bitties. <laughs> you should oh, open man. some Garbage Pail car uh, Kids cards, and I'll open my copy of Godzilla on PS4. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, s I can't believe that that fucking game is I worth know. what it's worth. Like Godzilla, that game? dog shit Godzilla game for PS4. Chris, what's it worth? Uh, about five hundred dollars. What Holy the shit. fuck? What? If well, you can I mean, find it, that's how like, it goes. Like, wasn't wasn't Dragon Ball Final bout up that level for the with you factor in inflation back in the day? Wow. And that game was garbage too. It was yeah. only popular because Dragon Ball was popular, and now Indeed. Godzilla is popular. Is that that's the most valuable problem. PS4 game? I I don't was, know. I don't know if it's the most because I mean I'm people sure are RPG trying to sell. Is worth more. There's some rare RPG on Maybe, PS4. Maybe, but like it's well, just like a standard edition of a game. Yeah, I was gonna say because that special edition of Final Fantasy VII remake is now like a thousand if you can get it if you have it sealed and the You're bike crazy. is sealed and everything. No, I can tell you right now the rarest PS4 RPG I got over here still ain't worth much as shit. <laughs> so I don't know what to say about well, that. Well, then again, I forget Lacrimosa of Dana is apparently worth a lot of money, but the rarest RPG I've got on the system to my knowledge is not worth much money so i kind of Lacrimosa, find that lacrimosa of dana on ps4 yeah joe was the one who told me about it huh 
I have my day one edition. It cost me eight dollars. I just bought it because yeah. oh, it was like oh, we, I can't afford have, not to buy it. Jeez. We have to clarify. I you think it's the though. CE. I, th- I think it was specifically the CE, though it's still okay. worth it because that game is fantastic. But no, in yeah, this case, I, it's the CE. I went ahead and downloaded it on Switch because I didn't want to pay full price for the <laughs> for an incomplete special edition, which is what everyone's selling right now. What for ease? Ease eight, yeah, on the Switch. Like what the um, physical incomplete? edition is very hard to find right now. But what makes the CE incomplete? Or they say they send well, the disc the without the game. Yeah, people are no people are selling the CE without the the any uh, anything but the game. It's like here's all the stuff that's in it, and it's like not in there. It's just the game card. I've done that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's dirty. That. So they're just basically selling you an empty box with a card in it. No, I you're getting so, yeah. all the collector stuff too. You're just not getting yeah, that's the what game. I'm saying for the, the people who stuff's not in there. That's that's well, for people who already the have the game. But oh, weren't absolutely. able to buy the collector's edition stuff. I've sold a bunch of I'm, stuff on Mercari like that. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying the inverse. I'm I'm saying yeah. they're selling the game by itself without the CE stuff, mm. but as a CE. <laughs> it's kind of oh. stupid. The, the yeah. CE is the <laughs> stuff. It's literally the stuff. <laughs> There's yeah, no yeah, special yeah. just in the game. People are weird. I, yeah, I don't yeah. know. That's, that's what's going on right now. So I'm like, I just went ahead and downloaded it. And you know what? I'm happy with that. You should be because the honestly, we're, I think I'm in, I'm hitting that point now where like CEs mean so little to me. Selling them is one thing, but buying new ones, I've been doing pretty freaking good at not buying CEs anymore. The last well, one I Superman bought was good. Who's Superman? Who? What? Jumps? <laughs> what are you? T- what are you talking about? I have I was, no I was idea. Correcting your poor grammar. That's all. Oh. Fuck you! Anyway, I love this guy. <laughs> the, the, last, <laughs> the last CE I bought was La Mulata 1 and 2. Because yeah. it's La Mulata, and I could not not buy that. Of I course you bought that Double one. Double negative! Double negative! Slam! <laughs> I just, um... I just received a, uh, a CE that I ordered from Limited Run back in August. <laughs> yeah? What that? What's that? Uh, the Atui collection. Oh, god damn! I'm waiting for one I ordered last July. I ordered the uh, Obra Dinn special, and uh... I actually just saw that at the store. Not the special, of course, just the yeah, base. yeah, yeah. The regular, edi- the regular edition is out and about, but the special is, is yeah. not quite yet. I'm eyeing up yeah. there. No more heroes. One and two, two pack. I don't want to comment run. on that right now. Why? I, uh, <laughs> no about those reason. <laughs> it's not for me, but I also ordered the uh, the insane like giant $150 CE of the Scott Pilgrim game. Oh, God. Ooh. Yeah, I got I got a less uh, extravagant version of that game. I felt like I had to. That's like the poster boy for why Limited Run exists. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, these games that you can't buy anymore, we got that shit. But we don't do it often enough. We just sell you games that you bought five months ago digitally. And then you have to wait six months to get them. <laughs> oh, no, no. That's, that's the thing. That sucks. But if it was wait six months, but you at least bought it before buying it digitally, that's like, okay, yeah. I'm paying the price of waiting. I'm saying game comes out. There's no word from limited run if they even might get it. So you grab it. And then like um, like six months later, oh, look what we're selling for 30 bucks. Don't want it to go lost because it's lost to the ether. And you're like, well, yeah. fuck, I mean. People are buying it twice, three times, and maybe I don't fucking know. Right. It's just so. Did you like, get their physical copy of Fight and Rage Pernell? <laughs> no, Uh-oh. I didn't. Actually, I was about to say that that is exactly what you're describing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh... and that's why I didn't get it because I was like, I was like conflicted. Like on one hand, I would love that. On the other hand, I already have the fucking game. Like, if I didn't yeah. have it yet, I would have done that. Mm. So the funny thing is about Limited Run is when you order something that takes them forever to make. Don't order it with other stuff because that other oh, stuff yeah. will get packaged with it and you'll and stuff that shouldn't be delayed will get delayed along with your delayed thing. Yeah. So well, on top of everything, individually, pretty- everything a la carte. Yeah, exactly. A la well, carte, I learned that carte. now. Fill but your carte. Get it all carte. Knowing, knowing the bad <laughs> luck, they'll just like sell it at a convention like, oh, it got stolen by rodents. But um. But I didn't know that seven months ago. So when I ordered this Atui collection, I also ordered the Grandia HD collection and um, uh, what's the Neptunia 7? Is it Mega Dimension Neptunia 7? Yeah, Mega think. Dimension Neptunia 7. It's been so long since I ordered it. I don't remember the title of it. I didn't even remember ordering it. I was just opened the box. I was like, oh, hey, I ordered this. What is it called? <laughs> Mega Dimension Saturalia? Oh, yeah. No, I, I think it is just Mega Dimension Neptunia 7. Anyways, 
But the Grandia <laughs> HD remasters, like, I just bought those in the interim because I was like, I don't need to wait for this. <laughs> like, it's on sale now for, like, less than 20 bucks or something around Christmas. So I was just like, whatever, I'm just going to get it. So I bought now that, I this- like, the day it came out, and I haven't fucking touched it yet. I I started a game, but I'm like, I literally started it and turned it off <laughs> only yeah. because I was like sleepy or something that day. And I was like, I can't actually invest any time in this. And then I just never went back to it. So speaking of investing someday. time into things, uh, we should probably get to review. I was about to say, I was like waiting for that, that segue. I, I was, segue I was going to do week. one earlier when Pernell was talking about the garbage pail kids of like, speaking of retro stuff, uh, speaking first, of garbage, speaking of garbage, garbage <laughs> pail <laughs> kids, there's some games. We got a bunch of bullshit games to talk about tonight. And how <laughs> <laughs> that would suck if they're all bad. No, no, mine aren't. Has there ever been an episode in the entire like eight hundred or, or seven or eight hundred plus episode history where there has been all bad games no. in one episode? No, I've, we're, we're I've very forgiving one. on this show. I've had one episode where just my games, like it was like three of them, and I think I gave the best rating I gave to one was a try it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was. I it was. I don't remember what it was though, so I'm not even gonna try and remember but i do yeah. remember that that was a thing like i don't know what's going on here this was the this was a bad luck week but then your next week was gold baby gold yeah it usually is well let's find out how this week is how about that <laughs> yeah sound good everyone ready for reviews i guess so i mean only i have to be ready because i'm first yeah you are first so true. tim are you ready or are you gonna lollygag I'll lollygag. I'll lollygag. <laughs> no lollygag. I'll drag, I'll drag my feet like the shambling protagonist of the game I'm reviewing. Exactly. Dick. Oh, God. Purnell's got to jump in with everything. Damn it, Purnell. Right. He had a good one to start things off. <laughs> and I ruined it like I a chick. fucked it up. <laughs> anyway, first game to talk about tonight is called Stubbs the Zombie, developed and published by Aspire. Released March 16th on Xbox One, Switch, and PS4 for 1999. It's 1959, and the city of Punchbowl, PA, is a beacon of progress and ideal living. Show the living that law and order are no match for a dead man on a mission. Your boyfriend's back, Maggie, and Punchbowl is going to be in trouble. Be the zombie, kick ass, and take brains. Tim, tell us about your time with Stubbs the Zombie. Man, the most unrealistic thing about this game is not the zombie. It's that any place in Pennsylvania could be the best place to live. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Speaking from experience, I can agree with that in every possible way. Where's the lie? Where's the lie? Um, Yeah, Stubbs the Zombie. So uh, in case you didn't know, this game's fucking old. Um, Stubbs originally came out on the the original Xbox. uh, The Xbox OG in the year 2005. And speaking uh, of expensive games, that one could get like one fifty. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, like that that's makes, why we got our re-release then. Yeah, well, that makes sense because it, it was a like uh, um, uh, up till this point, it was only available on uh, the original Xbox. Correct, mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. I'm not sure yeah. if there was a PC version or not. I yeah, don't. Know. I don't. I don't think so. I think that was kind of a just an OG Xbox exclusive, and it's funny that it came out in. Um, you know, 2005, which was also the year that the Xbox 360 uh, came out. Um, same year. So, yeah, very late original Xbox game at that. Uh, so, yeah, this is a game <laughs> from 2005, an, an open world ish sort. Yeah, that's kind of a stretch. Not really open world. The, the stages can be be kind of open. So, yeah, you are you are Stubbs the zombie. You come rip tearing out of the ground in this future ish city. Think kind of like. Uh, fallout but the bombs haven't dropped yet that's kind of the vibe of the city um and that it's like 1950s futuristic uh so you play a zombie which was super novel at the time less novel now when there's been a lot more zombie games but very novel <laughs> at the time um and still i the vibe of it you know is is pretty funny and goofy um so your stubs, you you come out of the ground, you start biting into people's brains. Uh, you bite into a person's brain, you turn them into a zombie. Then you end up with this little zombie horde following your ass around. Um, and you go through uh, a number of stages doing zombie shenanigans and hijinks. So uh, you go through these levels and you uh, have your zombie crew that you build up kind of following you around. Uh, you get some abilities like being able to like roll your head. Uh, as an explosive, you can fart, 
uh, very deadly, which starts making everyone gag, makes it easy for you to uh, go up and eat their brains. Good old um, fart humor. Gotta love good them. Old, good old fart humor. Stuff like that. Like, the, the game is is nonsense in that way. It's it's not taking itself too seriously. Um, so you shamble around. You uh, you collect your zombie horde. And, and like... <laughs> Oh, again, this this was all very novel uh, for the time. Um, it, it was just like a very interesting premise and in execution for a game. Um, I just feel like since then there's been like a lot of zombie games and like a lot of weirder stuff out there. But anyways, so you you go through the levels. There's um, it, it's mostly kind of the the shambling around uh, from from place to place. Uh, building up your zombie horde, you know, sometimes you go here and there and like flip a switch or, um, you know, you got, you got to kill some specific dudes, but for, for the most part, it's pretty straightforward zombie shambling around. There's like some vehicle sections mixed in. It's, it's a decently, you know, uh, it, it's nothing like mind blowing, I guess by, today's standards um nor is it in x execution you definitely see like that age uh just kind of in the levels and that they can be very sparse um and there isn't always clear objective markers uh but um you know it's it's what i was gonna say yeah the game could definitely use with some direction at points uh there's a lot of open areas where you're just kind of uh, the, the first driving section, I'm just driving say, yeah, around for how long, fucking, like, where the yeah. fuck do I go? What do I do? Yeah. That first driving section is a, like, there's no, yeah, is, is a real man. <laughs> where, where are you going in this? <laughs> um, because this, this is just basically a straight, uh, shined up port. It's not like a, a remaster. It is not updated in any way other than like it looks decently nice running on a modern TV on modern consoles. There is uh, near as I can tell, like no, you know, additions to like the options or the UI or anything like this is Stubbs the zombie as it existed uh, 16 years ago, raised from the dead <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to, to haunt us once more. Um, so yeah, it's like, do you, <laughs> need so i guess the, the question is just like how you know i don't think that stubs the zombie is an essential game per se i think it is uh it does some interesting things it has like kind of a fun sense of humor um but i think your mileage will vary as to how much you are going to get out of stubs in the year 2021 you know, this this is definitely a game that was released for people who already played the game. I don't think this is going to win over many new people to the Stubbs the Zombie uh, franchise if they if they bring it back or not. Uh, I I don't think this is really meant to get new players. I think it's mainly meant mm-hmm. for a nostalgia wave. And they rode that pretty hard by saying this is mm-hmm. the game, you know, and remember, mm-hmm. it just looks a little bit better now. Yeah, pretty much. And it's only 20 bucks. So what do you think? Yeah, I think I think it, it is a it is worth a try. I mean, there is going to be some people out there that, you know, like we were just saying, Stubbs is a is an expensive game on the secondhand market. So um, that this might be the only realistic way to play it outside of just, you know, emulating it or, or what have you. Um, so. You know, if you played Stubbs back in the day, day and you don't have a, a physical copy of it available and you want to relive the magic of Stubbs the Zombie, like this this is the game you're looking for. Um, does the average gamer need to relive the the magic of Stubbs the Zombie? Probably not. So it kind of averages out in the uh, in the middle there. <laughs> Works for me. I, I can agree with that. It's definitely not for everyone, but... The people who remember the game and have fondness for the game, I think they're going to find a lot to yeah. still enjoy here. I yeah. think it, it's, it holds it's still up funny and well. weird. Yeah, if but you can you it shows its age, but it's still kind of funny and weird and, and has its charm to it. Yeah, Carnage saying or people like me who missed it the first time around and now get a chance to play it on new consoles. Yeah, so there you go. 
All right, next game to talk about is Cyanide and Happiness Freak Apocalypse Part 1 Hall Pass to Hell, developed by Explosum, published title, by Serenity guys. Forge, released March 11th on Switch and PC for $19.99. Taking place in the Cyanide and Happiness universe, you play as a weird, unpopular, ginger-headed orphan, and it's time to save the world or maybe make things even worse. Purnell, tell us about Cyanide and Happiness Freak Apocalypse Part 1 Hall Pass to Hell. Clearly a protagonist that, that Purnell can relate to, a ginger a ginger orphan. Sir <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had hair. Um Carnage saying so we play as eternal. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> Damn! This you is like this is game. like this, this is like the asshole hour on SM. Now what are we going? That do? wasn't even meant to be a shot. It was just a just your an average run of the mill joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's a god damn! You're on fire. Grants and <laughs> crack fire tonight, but nonetheless, it's fine. <laughs> this game, honestly, like it's it's fairly enjoyable. Like it's a the idea behind it is that you are playing as this coop character, which, for the record, I think it's funny how. He's meant to be like this unlikable loser type character, yet he's written as a fairly clever kid. So it's like, if anything, I feel like he should have tons of friends. But I digress. This is, this anyway. is based on something, isn't it? The comics. Well, well comic, the comics. Right? Yeah, it's yeah, like elements comic. of the comics in it. Don't yeah. say that like it's obvious and everyone should know. It well, is I think your cyanide and you happiness really is an obvious <laughs> one. All right, <laughs> you okay. should have known. Well, let me tell you what. <laughs> I'm not well, for like, those who I don't know cyanide and happiness is an online web comic that is pretty fucked up it, Man, if you have so facebook you've seen it this. i'm sure I, I yeah i when i when i googled it just now i'm like oh i've seen that drawing before i just didn't know that this drawing was that. drawing yeah. drawing drawing how about drawing <laughs> drawing <laughs> <laughs> how drawing uh so this game involves a kid who's considered a loser, but he's not a loser. And it starts out with a wacky little bit of a premise where he gets in trouble in class in a side night and happiness sort of way. And he gets into the principal's office, resulting in the principal giving him a weird lecture and preparing to permanently splotch his permanent record to make him a loser forever. Oh, fucking no. But then he gets a hilarious call that makes him leave just at the right time for Coop to go on a weird quest to fix his permanent record and then do heroic things. Well, heroic things in the sense of just like helping general people in the community or rather his school. So the game plays through an unfortunately short experience. If you just kind of blitz the game in a sense, if you basically just knock out the missions and go through it. But as it is, <clears throat> it's done by way of like sort of a point and click adventure. You can use the left stick to walk around, but the right stick moves a cursor, which is what you use to interact with things. And whenever you scroll over an interactable object, you can look at it, touch it, or speak to it. And the thing that I think gives this game the most of its charm and is also the way you're going to get the majority of your playtime out of part one is the fact that every one of those interactions is fully voiced. So... Every character is fully voiced. Coop, fully voiced for every one of those options. Any object has dialogue, and every character has dialogue like that. And I won't say it's all hilarious. There's some hit and miss stuff, as you'd expect from a game that's trying to be funny the entire time. Um, but it is funny enough that I definitely laughed out loud a few times. And I've just generally enjoyed myself. Most of my playtime just came from talking to, like, reading up on, like, every object in the game. Like, if I came across a book, it was like, for example, the library, when you come across it, you can look at every bookshelf and get multiple comments about the books on all the shelves. It is immense. And it takes time. But it's enjoyable time. So, for me, that's the majority of where the fun comes in. But even if you're just kind of progressing through the game itself and you don't care about that, which it'd be kind of crazy for you to feel that way in a point and click adventure. Um, <laughs> you'll still get some wacky characters in and of themselves. Like every character in this game, their names are pretty much meant to be punny. Like the hall monitor's name is Holly Pass. Ha ha ha. Uh... Um, yeah. There's a guy named Walter Fountain who's drinking water at the fountain. Uh... Who would have saw that shit coming? I like it. 
<laughs> oh no, I'm not knocking it. It's just also obvious. It's like obvious, but also surprisingly entertaining. Like I enjoyed it. I'm and sure like, Carnage I, loves all the puns. Like almost every character has a punny name to him. I kind of like that. Um, and there's like just weird things. Um, Dark Mickey with like that one, like one part in the game where you're in the library and there's a kid reading book, a book in the library, like the dictionary, and every word he reads is like a ridiculously dirty word. And he's like, <laughs> what, the heck? Who, like, what dictionary are you reading? Those should not be in a dictionary in a school. Um, Maybe, um, is it like Touch Dick on the Nintendo DS? <laughs> <laughs> that's an actual game that was an actual dictionary that came out on the ds it's called touch dick dic yeah. <laughs> maybe it was talking about the animation company just touch the animation company dick. Forget it. <laughs> touch dick. <laughs> you had a lot of dick on tape back in the day <laughs> <laughs> you have a fair swath of it oh, um that tape on your dick now it's all on the internet <laughs> for the world to see uh, but Y'all scare the thing me. about this, but I will honestly, genuinely say that I personally found the game to be entertaining. Like I would also say flat out though that if you don't like the cyanide and happiness style of humor, you really won't like this game because they they make a lot of jokes, some of which could be considered offensive if you're in that kind of if you're not in that wheelhouse for it. So warning in advance, um, coming here we're looking for some no holes barred jokes. Um, but uh, I think it would be it safe to say if you're not a fan of cyanide and happiness, you're probably not seeking this game out in the first place. That is true. However, I don't want to outright like bar people who not are not familiar with cyanide and happiness because this could be what gets them interested in it. And, you know, like just like how people didn't know about them, but they bought Joking Hazard, and now they think they're funny. Um, so, I mean, in that regard, it's definitely worth it. if you like cyanide and happiness. It's an easy sell, even with it being a short part one release. Um, but in the sense that you're not. It's like it's. I say it's like more of a like, like a try it sense because one, I think the humor could still reach out to you if you're into that kind of thing. But two, some people might find themselves thinking, well, if it's only part one and it's short, maybe I'll wait for other releases to come out and see how the story progresses and reviews, and then decide if I want to plunk down. Kind of like how some were with a uh, the penny arcade games back in the day. Yeah. So like I'll wait till see how the second and the eventual way eventual third game plays out and then buy those. Um, yeah, it makes you wonder but, if we're going to get part two and part three of this. It, I hope so. Just because like you never know what games are going to come out that are episodic that just never finish. Well, in the case of this, if I remember correctly, I think this was a kickstarted game. So the money's in the kitty. It's just a matter of if he wants to spend the time on it. And if he doesn't, then that's going to be a pretty big blemish for someone who's got an ongoing webcomic. No. So so I, I have high hopes that we'll get the, from the future games in that regard. It's just a matter of weighing them out. Well, as this one stands for 20 bucks for the installment, what do you think a hall pass to hell? I'd say if you're a cyanide fan, it's a buy it, but otherwise it's a try it, both because of the humor and also because of how you you value your 20. That's all. But I enjoyed it. Works for me. All right. Next up is Tank Brawl 2 Armor Fury, developed by Fung Games, published by Thundercloud Studio, released March 26th on Xbox One for $14.99, an epic four-player co-op armor shooter with RPG upgrade system and fully destructible world. You can control both land and sea vehicles or even a mecha, which can be combined with four drivers to create different classes to fight a fast-paced epic battle with monsters, tanks, trains, and battle cruisers. Tim, tell us about your time with Tank Brawl 2 Armor Fury. Oh, boy. What a title. Um, so, uh, oh, boy. So, uh, you know, the the over this is, this is an overhead, um, uh, like, kind of you know, like twin stick action game, as has kind of been a common existence since the early days of the Xbox Live Arcade um, in, in tank format, nonetheless. Uh, lends itself well to tanks. So yeah, it's an overhead action game where you have it. You have twin stick controls or driving your tank around. For the most part, uh, the game lets you switch around some camera angles a bit, uh, which makes some weird things happen with the controls sometimes. Um, and there's actually there is there's a, a, a tank with a stationary turret, so that does not operate on twin stick controls. But for the most part, that's what you're looking at. Um, so you you drive around, you uh, kill shit. Um, actually, there's a really weird sequence. The the game 
oh God, the tutorial of this game is so fucking bad. Uh, where you start out as a guy and you have to like build your tank first. But like the first thing is like there's a guy who's like press left stick to move towards me and you move toward him and then he kills you and he goes, ha! <laughs> <laughs> gotcha! And I'm just like, that's like why? some Undertale shit right there. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> why are you doing this to me? I'm trying to learn how to play your game. Um, so then I realized, like, okay, you have to avoid <laughs> this guy. You have to avoid a bunch of other guys to go around and, like, pick up the pieces to your uh, tank and then put your tank together. And it's like you pick up a tank tread and it, like, it doesn't, like, elegantly strap to the back of your character or just disappear into their inventory. No, it just, like, <laughs> fuses with your person as you're walking around it's weird uh as a choice but you know that is what it is um so you get your tank together and and then you you start uh you start proper moving around in the world in, in the the advertised the the expected format right so and, and that's like all well and good and, and the game does a i will say does a good job of kind of like changing things up like even within a mission like you'll kind of get on you'll you'll be just like you know uh, just tra- traversing the landscape like mowing down some guys and then like suddenly you'll be stopped in a place and it's like well okay in here you have to um do a you you just kind of have to hold off the enemies in this like m- the city of buildings and you shoot the buildings and the buildings fall over uh and and that's a thing and then you move on and you find new tanks uh, which is cool. And different tanks each have different upgrade trees. There will be like little cogs you find around the, uh, the levels that you can use for upgrades and they're fully refundable at any time, which is cool. Just in case you buy something that is uh shit. <laughs> um, and, and those, and those cogs, uh, like, it's not like you use, Oh, I used, uh, a, uh, whatchamacallit, a, uh, cog on this tank that that cog is still available to use on another tank so you're kind of upgrading all of them all at once which is cool you're not having to like decide between them and you're not having to like well i'm going to use this tank now so i'm going to strip all the upgrades out of this one not that there's like a ton of them like these tech trees aren't huge they have maybe like 10 nodes on them um and uh and then go from there so it's all well and good at the base level kind of the problem i have is that this game is just like a mess it is messy in (laughs) what way uh in the way that so like kind of the oh my god so you'll get one one of the things that like first really started stood out to me uh in in terms of its kind of shoddiness is like the way the music will pop in and then mostly pop out and just disappear um from the levels like it doesn't play It'll just be like, okay, it'll start at a prompt and then it'll go away after like five, 10 seconds and it'll go away. And I'm like, okay, just like the way your tank shells hit enemies or buildings for that matter. It's not like they crash into them. You know, they shoot into them with a, with a satisfying explosion. No, they like, it's like they stick into them. Like they were an arrow and then the enemy kind of blows up and the explosion is not terribly satisfying. Like the way, buildings fall down is the same way it feels like very flimsy but it just like looks weird and is not very satisfying and like the enemies will just spawn in um out of nowhere uh on the levels like they will just boop appear in possibly next to you possibly right on top of you they'll just spawn in where they're meant to spawn in and there isn't like a spawner there to say like, oh, this is where an enemy is going to show up. It's, it's just like, like surprise, we're here. Which is extremely annoying with with like some because there's enemies. You know, you only have a couple hits on your tank at least. You know, at base level, you know, unupgraded. Um, and uh, <laughs> like sometimes, like there will be these like suicide guys that just like run at you and scream. And when one of those, like those are impossible to deal with when you have the 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 tank with the the stationary turret um so you kind of have to switch to the the one of the other ones for that um just kind of like the 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 general hit detection the um way in which uh <laughs> so i read so there one one thing that's kind of uh, irritating about the mechanics of the game is that when your tank takes enough damage um your rider will pop out of it 
Um, but you're pretty much fucked already if you're getting knocked out of that tank. Like nothing good is gonna come of that. Yeah. Like at, after that point, like once you're out, it's it's bad. Like you're gonna die <laughs> pretty much immediately. It is a a bad scene. Uh, and also, uh, wow, one of my bigger pet peeves in any game is just like when I see spelling or grammatical errors of which this game has plenty is just like, it just feels shoddy to me. Like you didn't finish making it or finish polishing it up. And that's what this feels like to me is like, it's a decent, um, you know, overhead tank action game. You know, it's, it's fine. Good in that base. Regard. It's just rough around it's, the edges. It's, it's a solid base, but it is very rough around the edges. And when there is just like so many games out there and so many games of this ilk out there, it's just like, why would you do this unless you're, you know, why would you even look at this right now in its current state? Like you got to fix this up. Um, you know, well, I was looking at this one for 15 bucks. So sell it to me or should I hold off? You should absolutely hold off to see if this game gets some patches to, to clean some of this stuff up. Cause it's just like an aggravating experience to play when it's just like, it, it feels like unfinished. It feels like they just got to the, <laughs> up to the finish line and we're like, eh, no, just like tossed it across. Good like, enough. Just to, yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's stuff that can be fixed in a patch and, and cleaned up and, and you have a solidly fun, if not, you know, it wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a exceptional game, even at that rate, but like, you know, it, at least it would, you know, everything would work and you, I you know I'd feel pretty good about it at that point, but as it is, it's like, no, no, not so much. I know the, the dev mentioned that there is a patch coming. I don't remember what so. all is <laughs> in that patch. Trying to see if I could pull up uh, the enemy spawning and the top down view is going to be improved in a few areas as well. And they're going mm -hmm. to address the enemy spawning and they oh. are definitely receptive of feedback. They're asking for any feedback so that they could try mm -hmm. getting it in the patches. And so if if they update this and they they fix it up and clean it up, we'll take another look at it. I'll take a I'll deign to I'll deign to give it another look. <laughs> You that yeah, the thing you, you already know the things you got to fix. You already know. <laughs> Just head, 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 yeah. All right. Well, next game is called Bite the Bullet, developed by Mega Cat Studios, published by Graffiti Games, released March 19th on PS4 for fourteen ninety nine. Run, gun and eat your way through this roguelite RPG shooter in a world where every enemy is edible. What you eat and how much you eat drives everything from your waistline to branching skill trees to weapon crafting. Shoot fast, eat big, satisfy your appetite for destruction. Chris, tell us about your time with Bite the Bullet. Uh Oh, is Chris here? Yeah, you don't want to hear about my time with Bite the Bullet again. Yeah, 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 I'm here. Okay, there he is. <laughs> my microphone was unmuted, but I had Skype muted. <laughs> uh, proud and, of you. Yeah. Yeah, and oh, I was actually, how? before I realized that I, uh, before I realized that I was muted, I was like, oh yeah, Tim talked about this one before, right around the same time he started <laughs> saying, you don't want to know how I thought about this one. <laughs> Yeah, so what did uh, you think of it? We know Tim wasn't too impressed with the game the first time around. What did you think? Tongue. Well, um, here's the thing, is that I really enjoy some things about the game. Um, sprite work is great. Uh, I really think it looks good, even though sometimes the lighting kind of causes you to not be able to tell what's going on super well. But that's kind of dependent on what kind of level you get, because it's a roguelike, so it's like the levels are kind of you know, um, stitched together in, in random ways. So, you know, but yeah. Um, and to briefly summarize, it's a, it's a run and gun where basically every enemy, if you can weaken them enough with your, with your guns, then you can eat them because this is a somewhat comedic, but I guess it's like one of those games that like gets, uh, serious at certain points, but like it's mostly comedic in that people can eat anything, and you've got like a dude called Chewy or a lady called Chewella, who um, you know, they're just this this Rambo type that like you know that a totally not evil corporation like <laughs> entity is like sending to a planet to like murder and eat everything so that they can sample genetics from unwilling participants, quote unquote. Yeah, God. the game's like. It's very transparent, but that's like an action film, right? Um, 
So yeah, like I like the way the game looks. <laughs> Dark Mika uh, the is way- there a Chewbacca? <laughs> Uh, probably the game like okay so and this is like kind of something that Purnell was talking about with his one of his games too was that like they try for every food related wordplay or pun that they possibly can so it's like it's everything from like food puns to just saying like I know your plate is full but can you go for another (laughs) serving like you know and if you like food based wordplay, then this is paradise. Uh, it's <laughs> automatically upgraded to a buy it. If like if your your level of humor is just oh that reminds me of food, I love it. <laughs> um, the other thing that I like about it is the fact that of course it's basically an RPG as much as it is a run and gun because of the amount of like micro management that you do with the kinds of things you eat, the kind of calories, fat and proteins that you take in that are going to like do everything from change your body to, you know, decide what weapons you get. Um, and none of it is bad. It's so, you know, games and, and eating mechanics have like a weird history. Like, you know, there was an old Famicom game called Yumi Penguin Monogatari. That oh, was yeah. Yes, classic. Everybody knows that and, yeah. One. Yeah, yeah. Household it's name. Very- it's where you play as a penguin who, um, instead of taking damage, you because all the enemies are food, you get fat and your girlfriend leaves you <laughs> for a for a thinner penguin who's clearly evil because he has a top hat and sunglasses and like a mustache. He, no, but it's implied. I mean, they are penguins. An implied mustache. It's an implied mustache. <laughs> Anyways, so but you know so like. Obviously, they're like, oh, well, getting fat is bad. Um, but in this game, it's not bad. You just get higher defense. So it's kind of like, um, you know, the game doesn't feel like a big fat joke, which is nice. Um, I like that about it. But yeah, like ultimately what happens and here's I was thinking really hard about why I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. Um, I think that with run and guns, you just you need structure. You need levels you can learn. Um And the fact that it's, like, randomly generated is just kind of like, well, I'm going to go in here and blast stuff until I die. And then we're going to distribute points, and then I'm going to go in there again. You know, and that's fine. It just wasn't as compelling. I kind of feel like this game would be, like, super good if it actually did have fixed levels. Hmm. Um, But having said, like, most of it's actually pretty good. Like, it's, it's weirdly, like... For the fact that it's random, like, the the gameplay aspect of it is random, it's so, it's so, like, in-depth in its character building, you know? (laughs) Like, and the sprite art is so good, and, like, there's a lot of other aspects to it that are, like, really good, and I'm kind of like, why didn't they just design some levels? (laughs) You know, instead of, like, having them randomly stitched together like, you know, 50% of games are now anyways. Yeah, those roguelikes are getting to be some like sort of an easy production, which kind of sucks because I like roguelikes, but yeah, it doesn't but make it any cl- less true. But yeah, but that's the thing is that you know normally that is something that you would do to um, not be lazy. I mean, I, I would never, I wouldn't accuse anybody not that's not Gilson B. Pontus of being lazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fuck you, <but>. Gilson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming after you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, like. That's the thing is that, like, in every other aspect, there's so much effort that went into this game. I'm kind of like, you know, what would it's just like my mind, like imagining what would happen if the same effort was put into, like, designing these killer levels and, you know, things like that. And I'm kind of like, you know, I think that's where the game kind of falls a little flat. However, I don't think it's a bad game. I actually I I think that, um, well, I guess I'll go ahead and summarize. Um, I would give it like. A try it and actually a buy it if you are like into um into roguelites that like let you build on your character. It's actually pretty compelling. Like the building system is really cool. It's just the actual run and gun gameplay is kind of mediocre. Yeah. Tim, any thoughts? Anything you want to chime in on? No, I didn't like it. <laughs> that, that was my opinion. I like Chris's spin on it though. <laughs> Not spin. I mean, that sounds like you're like you know a paid marketeer, but. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, they well, they yeah, accuse yeah. me of ripping you off if I just said I didn't like it. That's true. But, that's I mean, true. again, there's some things I liked about it. There is definitely some stuff that I couldn't just wrap the whole thing up and say, you know, not recommended. I actually think that there's some stuff here that's really going to yeah. uh, resonate with some people. I think when you said that, like, when you were talking <laughs> about the micromanagement, I was like, yeah, that's right. I hated that shit. I'm like, that, that was like the line <laughs> for me was that. See, I like that. that. 
I like that in RPGs. Mm -hmm. You know, it remains to be seen whether I think that's the best thing for running guns. But however, you know, and like that's the other thing, too, is like there's a little self-defeating thing where like if you make your character too powerful, you can't eat enemies anymore because you're blowing them all up. (laughs) <laughs> the point is you have to weaken enemies so it's kind of like you have to manage your damage in a run and gun <laughs> like that's a that's a weird thing because yeah like i try to make my character as powerful as possible because my gameplay style is glass cannon i like to be the strongest but dead in one hit um and yeah i was like blowing up everything i was like oh i can't eat anything now <laughs> i have to lower my my attack so that things don't just get killed anyway it's <laughs> It's interesting, anyway. I was like, wouldn't that balance out over time, though, like on a future stage? I think so, but again, they're they're like they're randomly designed, so I'm not exactly sure when they like introduce like because every time I went in, it was like the same type of stuff, just a little different. Mm-hmm. So I haven't, I'd never ran into like any enemies that were like, oh, this is actually going to, um, you know, really test my, the limits of my build. No, and of your your digestive strength. Yeah. <laughs> so it feels like, you know, for all the, the effort done into making it, you know, micromanagement, it's like you still kind of have to go for balance. But of course, then you, you know, if you pick a vegan, for instance, you can't eat meat, which, by the way, I like that. I like that you can be a vegan in a game about <laughs> shooting everything to death. You can still be like, no, I will not consume meat. <laughs> oh, there is Lord. a line. <laughs> <laughs> I don't All know. Right, I, I well, like we got to move <laughs> on. The next game yeah. to talk about is called Body Quest, developed and published by Artax Games, released March 25th on the Switch for $5.99. A mysterious virus from outer space is threatening mankind, and your best friend Finn is the very first patient infected. Oh, God, no, not a virus. Uh, is but n- been a vegan? <laughs> too soon, too soon. But not everything is lost as the young team of scientists is here to help. Using cutting edge technology, they'll be able to get themselves into Finn's body and combat the virus and its destruction to save his life. And at the same time, also the future of humanity. Uh, Tim, tell us about your time with Body Quest. All right. So this is a game for children. Um, just to be clear, this is not like that is not an insult or uh or what have you. That's just like, no, this is a, this is a game made for kids. Uh, it, it's simple in its look and its design. And it, and it is meant to help educate children about the wonders uh, and horrors of the, the human body. The um, fabled edutainment. Something like that. Yes. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I did, I did cut my kid loose on this to, to see, how he would do with it. So yeah, you, the, the game is broken down kind of by, um, uh, you know, sections of the body. Um, and, and as you go in to start trying to, to fix your friend, I, I don't think you are a doctor. This seems like maybe you shouldn't be doing this, but who am I to say, uh, you get to ride hoverboards around inside the human body and <laughs> shoot germs and shit with your little, uh, ray gun. Um, finally, finally, uh, so you'll you'll go through the the levels and you'll have like different objectives, which can be just like, OK, well, you need to find your way to the exit. You need to collect uh, a certain amount of uh, of an item like uh, calcium uh, does about a good. Excuse me. Oh, um, <laughs> <Gesundheit. laughs> and, or, you know, to defeat enemies or, or whatever. And, and the. Gameplay takes place from like an over a like three quarters view as you're you're surfing around um, and doing this stuff. And then there will <clears throat> at the end of a level at the end of a level, there will be like a quiz about uh, not necessarily things that were in the level, but just like parts of a body, like where bones are and like, uh, uh, yeah, st- stuff like that. There, there will be like a little quiz there to try to make sure you're learning something along the way. Um, so, you know, it, it has a a nice clean look to it. Uh, the, you know, it plays fine, uh, in, in just kind of zooming around and, and doing this thing. Um, the, so one problem, and and I've had this with like other kids games is like, it's really hard to take a kid's game and put it front in front of a kid when it's not voice acted. Um, sometimes because, you know, the kid may not be able to read yet. 
Uh, my kid can read decently well, but it would help a lot if the characters were voiced. I understand that costs money, but I think that's like a really important feature in games uh, for kids. Yeah, um, I can agree there. Because, because you know, the w- reading ability catches on at a, at a widely variable rate. So if you want to teach them something, uh, especially about you know the the human body where things have weird names uh that are not that certainly you know uh, you know an early reader would not be immediately like introduced to uh you, you need that voice acting so they know what those words are um and <laughs> it's another thing it, it's not like the game like gives you hints before the quizzes as to like you know you finding out like oh well the the femur is here and your cranium is here it's just like it just presents you with the quiz and then you just kind of trial and error it out on your own so it's not like you're actually applying learned material uh so you know the le- what you're doing in the levels doesn't really directly apply to what you are being quizzed on it's not like you're on a map and it's like oh well you are at the pelvis you need to go you know, up to the cranium uh, to retrieve some uh, or, or, you know, go up to the stomach. That would be a good place to go to get some calcium. You know, say someone drank some milk, just go get some calcium, then bring it back to like heal this, uh, this broken bone here. Um, So it's not like one really relates to the other. Um, And it also like in, you know, that, that having been said, I think the game is hitting a pretty, is is actually targeting and, and, and hitting a pretty narrow group of kids that will be both you know entertained by the simplistic gameplay but also like ready to learn complicated you know the basic biology of the human body like beyond like stomach lungs heart it's just like no like it starts you off and you're learning about bones um, and I don't know when I learned what a when a femur was but I don't think it might not have even been in elementary school uh, maybe at some point, but, uh, it was just like, you know, maybe you put a paper skeleton together and you're like, ah, look, there's all my uh, fucking feet bones. Yeah. Cause I'll swear in second grade. Fuck it. Yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was like, will I, well, no, no, it will we'll go. Yeah. We'll just say I did. Sure. Uh, so I have a you, kid in second grade. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Believe me. My, my, my child knows the words. Uh, he's, he's in kindergarten. He knows the forbidden words. Yeah. Uh, we- we had a slip of bastard during Hamilton. So. <laughs> I mean, at a certain point, I'm just too much. He knows he shouldn't say them. He knows they are bad words for sure. Um, sometimes I hear him muttering. I told him he can use all the swears he wants in his bedroom. Like, go up there, let it fly. You know, if you want to use the, <laughs> the, the, the forbidden words, go ahead. But anyways, so the game is actually, you know, effectively hitting, I think, you know, kids that are old enough to read old enough to be ready to learn about this stuff, but still young enough to be entertained by the simplistic gameplay, which I think my, my, you know, my kid is at at the point where like the gameplay, like he could, he's okay with that. But I think the subject matter like didn't take to him as well. Um, You're also, you're, I should mention you. So you're picking up because I want to make this joke. Um, You're picking (laughs) up currency as you're surfing around and you get three hits. And when you take your third hit, you then drop like a portion of your currency, like where your body was, but you can go back and retrieve it. Um, so this is the dark souls of child's <laughs> child, child's anatomy <laughs> games here. But the, the, the currency has nothing to do with the actual completion of levels. It's just used for cosmetics of like <laughs> unlocking new boards and, and different looks for your character and shit. Uh, but yeah, again, I just, I literally want to say that just for that joke. Just so, for the dark souls. Huh. Yes. <laughs> Well, this is only six bucks. What do you think of it? It's, well, man, it's only six bucks. I mean, fuck it. You might as well see if your kid enjoys it for six bucks. Like, even if they play it for like an hour, that's probably worth it to keep them out of your hair, right? Um, <laughs> Shuts them the if, fuck if up for were, an hour. If it were more, <laughs> it would be, you know, I, I'd say at worst, it's a try it. Like, you really have to think about, like, you know, where your kid is at um, and and how engaged you think they would be. Uh, you know, with with that kind of uh, material. Um, obviously, yeah. You no, know, if you're an adult, like, no, this is not for you, you idiot. Don't even no. It's, it's okay. It's for kids. But yeah. So yeah. Cool. But, yeah. Yep. 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 Cool. Sounds good. All right. That is it for you, Tim. We will let you get Yay. going. Yay. <laughs> uh, Rupert saying they want to see that on the box cover. Which which part? The, the, 
the, the, the dark souls of uh <laughs> keeps them out of your hair for an hour <laughs> yeah it's not that six bucks is worth that sometimes <laughs> absolutely cool well like, tim do you have any final words before we let you get going um i really don't I really don't not like tired i worked a very long day yesterday and then like my sleep backfired on me uh last night and i did not sleep in and i did not sleep well so i am just a sleepy boy i took a little bit of a nappy nap earlier but yeah no go get some rest right. thank you all right you guys have a good night bye <laughs> bye bye all right, next game to talk about is called Ruvato, Original Complex, developed and published by Rememory. Released March 26th on Xbox One for $14.99. Ruvato, Original Complex, is a fast-paced hack-and-slash game. Rhea gains attack power and becomes stronger each time she defeats her enemy. Play, get skilled, and chain kill multiple enemies with ease using Rhea's unique ability. Purnell, tell us about Ruvato, Original Complex. I'm going to get it out of the way. Domo Arigato, Mr. Uvato. This game is a title to play. There, done. Uh-huh. Okay, now the game. We can talk about it. So, Uvato is a game where you play as a woman named uh, Rhea. 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 Um, who, at the very beginning of the game, gets attacked, finds a girl in a lab in the middle of a mission that she is subsequently failing, um, and takes her home. Because that's what happens in games. Um, and it turns out this girl is actually particularly special and related to the failed mission. So the outfit that she was working with at the time of the mission that had since disbanded is now working to get her back, resulting in Rhea getting injured to the point of near death. And in the process of this, as she's dying, an old friend finds her, repairs her. She becomes a cyborg woman whose goal is now to rescue the lost girl whose name is I, AI. Um, so, but what the hell is the gameplay about in this regard? Because I basically just told the story in the sense that it's a pretty quick setup that gets you rolling, even though there's like little story snippets in the middle of the game. But anyway, the way the game works, however, it's, it's a series of short burst stages. So it's sort of like 1-1, 1-2, 1-3. And the levels generally can get beaten within 30 seconds to a minute. Um, usually pretty much 30 seconds there are levels where if you beat it with less than 20 in more than 20 if it takes you more than 20 seconds to win you get a b score so uh they get you and the idea behind this is that you start a level and your goal is to kill every enemy on the stage your abilities are to slash attack to dash dash is having a total set amount being three and a cooldown between each one so like you can dash three times in a row if you really felt like it, but then each each subsequent each dash has to be refilled back up to use it again. Um, you have the dash attack, the slash attack, and you can guard. Now, the thing that makes this game particularly intriguing, however, is the way the actual combat works. When you hit an enemy initially, you only do one damage, and every enemy has a hit point gauge on top of their or above their head, so you know how many hit points they've got. Each hit does one damage. When you kill an enemy, it doubles to become two attack. If you kill another person, you get three and four and five and so on. If you take too long to kill the next enemy, your gauge of attack will go down and you'll lose one at a time. And also, if you get hit, your gauge will get knocked down, so you'll lose an attack power. So, the way this game works and the way that you do well with high scores is you want to run around and kill enemies, get that attack power up, which you can then use to kill tougher enemies faster, and ultimately beat the stage, killing enemies from order in order of like weakest to strongest. In addition, you have a repost ability, a repost ability. I've never pronounced that word correctly. Chris probably can do it though. Um, like repost, where essentially you can like guard at just the right time to knock the guy off his off of balance and then attack him back to immediately do like double plus damage to the enemy and your attack bar will go up. And in a lot of ways to get high scores on stages, you have to hit, you have to beat your first enemy using that skill because you need that attack power jump immediately. Hmm. Um, so, so it's kind of like a puzzle game in addition to being a hack and slash. Exactly. It's like a hack and slash. I want to call it a platformer, but it's not a hundred percent platforming either. In a sense, what it is is a, uh, that dash attack also lets you kind of dash across the air. And there are certain pla- there are certain stages where there'll be a covering platforms where you have to kind of dash into the over to the platform and then dash off of it before it falls and you die. Uh, so 
that's why it would be considered platforming in a sense, but you're not actually jumping. You're just dashing to the platforms. Um, so yeah, but it's like, pretty much like you said, the whole general goal is to beat levels as quickly as possible by chaining enemy attacks, not getting hit and keeping the heat on as you progress through the stages quickly and effectively. Um, when you finish a level, you get graded on being the stage. Uh, higher scores yield you a high rank, which is tied to one of the achievements in the game. And also you get scrap. Higher your rank, the more scrap you get on the stage. And the purpose of using scrap is that in addition to the attacks I, the, the abilities I already mentioned, there's also a series of special abilities that you can get. Um, and they are all purchased and upgraded with scrap. There's one ability, for example, such as slow, where you'll slow enemies around you for a certain period of time. Um, there are not, like, there's a burn where you burn a group of enemies and you freeze a bunch of enemies and blah, blah, blah. But for me, given the nature of how this game plays, the only abilities I gave two hoots about and I rarely used them was slow down. One, and there's another ability where you immediately get an attack bump, which why not use that? Your whole goal is to freaking kill dudes quickly. Give me my attack boost immediately. Yeah. Um, and there's also one where you can like get, you can speed up your running speed and your attack speed. So that's another one that is good for the purpose of just, you know, trying to blitz high scores. Um, I'm sure there are ways to use the other abilities for similar reasons, but my mind was just focused on zip slash dash. That's my game style. So I didn't care about the other stuff. Um, the game play is addictive and fun. I'm not holding back on that at all. I had a lot of fun trying to get high scores, and I was obsessed with getting A's on every stage I did. Like, I wasn't leaving any B's or in the dust there. It wasn't happening. <laughs> um, but there are a few flaws that could prevent someone from liking this game or wanting to give this game a shot, and it's worth mentioning them before giving my verdict. Well, let's hear uh, So, for one, there are, like, there are a lot of freaking stages in this game. How, I want to say it's, like, maybe close to 100. However... The way they break the game up is every like 20 to 21 stages is a boss fight. Those 20 stages, though, is the same environment style. So you could get bored of the environment very fast. Enemies, too. Um, but once you beat that, like when you go to a new environment, the music doesn't change. And even though the, like, the, you know, the area around you looks different, most everything else looks exactly the same. Even most of the enemies you fight, it's just like now they have like red katanas or something. Um, so it loses some of the oomph as you get further in because there's a lot of repeat assets in a sense. And it's like, it's not invigorating in that regard. But, oh, and the other thing I should mention also is that uh, the music is repetitive too, because when you change stages, the music doesn't change. It's still that same beat or whatever the funny thing but, is uh, you mentioned that so you're just that's repetitive mm -hmm. <laughs> <Bye -o. laughs> by the way the music how's the music in the game it's okay like it's not it's, <laughs> damn it it's repetitive <laughs> Did i mentioned how repetitive it is very repetitive the most repetitive oh man but is it fun for 15 bucks is it fun Yes, that's what I'm, that's that's the overall gist. Of, like, if you're okay with those things that I mentioned, um, like for example, you're the type that can like pick up a game and play it and break bits and pieces here and there, get a few high scores, and also the boss fights are fun too. Um, then I think the game is still solid and it is a lot of fun to play. It's just getting that out of the way now, so people aren't coming in and saying, "Why didn't that asshole mention those things?" <laughs> um, but I enjoyed my time with the game and I think it's fun. And even if you find that the full price isn't worth it to you. I think it is definitely worth it when it goes on sale because it, it has a good gameplay loop. Cool. All right. Next up is Magic Twins, developed by Flying Beast Labs, published by Badland Publishing, released March 18th on the Switch for $12.99. Magic Twins is a cooperative arcade puzzle game in which Abra and Kadabra must use their chromatic powers to defeat hordes mm -hmm. of color elementals and stop the color Mageddon. Chris, tell mm -hmm. us about Magic Twins. It's colorful. <laughs> anyway that's the review okay. that's the whole review it's colorful <laughs> yeah thank you for reading my gamer rant review <laughs> anyways <laughs> okay so yes this game um is a one of two games that i'm talking about today that star cute witches um it's funny how sometimes things like line up like that but anyways yes so this is a yeah an arcade puzzle style game 
Uh, basically, yeah, you play as these twin witchy sisters who, um, basically the, the gameplay of it, like, you just go around a board and, like, you know, select levels, like, that's, that's just how it goes, like, it's, the overworld map is just, you know, uh, just such, and there, you know, there's a brief story where, yeah, somehow while trying to change the, um, color of their wardrobe, they, they do something and cause a color mageddon. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> the point is that it opens up these dimensional rifts, um, which I believe there are one, two, three, four, there's like seven or eight of them. So there's actually quite a lot of levels. Cause yeah, around each of these rifts is basically a game world. And, um, you know, you need to play like 10 ish, like eight to 10 stages in each one of those rifts. And the way it goes is that the actual gameplay of it has you, um, your witches on either side of the screen, and the rift is in the middle. Out of the rift are coming colored uh, creatures. And, you know, they are one of four, co- well, one of six colors, but, you know, including black and white, which, you know, those are kind of like non colors. But, um, and, you know, each one, you know, the black and white ones have their own rules too. But basically, uh, you fly your witches up and down you know, vertically um, their playing field and shoot the monsters with the appropriate color that you switch with the face buttons. So, like, you know, um, Y is blue, X is yellow, things like that. Um, Uh. Yeah. And so you got to, like, shoot the right colors. And, of course, they're advancing on the magic barriers that are, you know, on each side. So you have to uh, manage them, um, manage the hordes, that is, uh, before they can get to your barrier because if the barrier gets damaged you lose the round um so it's that simple now uh this is a completely different game depending on whether you're playing as one player or two players because the one player mode has you switching between the sisters because you have to manage both sides of the board yourself so it ends up becoming because there's a cpu control for the other character but i'm going to tell you about seven stages in (laughs) that that cpu is worthless um it kind of goes around and does what it's supposed to, but it does it very slow. It's like, you know, easy mode if you're fighting against it. Um, you know, and you could just trounce it, but in fact, it's on your side, so you kind of have to, like, uh, deal with it. So, yeah, you switch over to either side, um, and whichever side you're not currently playing, the other side has is the computer. Um, and so, yeah, that becomes, like, a thing of, like, well, you know, I'm managing the left side just fine, but now they're gathering up on the right side, so i got to switch over there right quick. And you know, get them going. Now, the what? other way to play and this is immensely preferable is with two players because then each char- each player is controlling one of the witches, and um, it becomes like really interesting because like you know you kind of require communication um, with the other person uh, for various gameplay things. Like there's certain enemies um, that kind of require a little more teamwork to defeat. Um, there's certain like I mentioned black. Um, enemies earlier, they're the ones that you have to shoot them once to find out what color they are, and then you can shoot them again. And there's other little tricks, like the first player can shoot um, things on the second player's board from behind, see, well, if, they're, if their shot is clear. <laughs> so, like, there's all kinds of cool strategies you can do as two-player um, that you can kind of do as one player if you're very good at watching the whole board and like switching between the witches, you know, on the fly, yeah. um, which, you know, you might be. Um, anyway, so the other thing is that every stage on top of just beating the stage, which is involves usually, um, you know, they always they always tell you the parameters at the beginning of the uh, round. And it's like, you know, it's either going to be like. Uh, and here's where the magic comes in. It'll either be like, you know, telling you to defeat this amount of enemies or all the enemies, or it might be cast these spells. And so um, certain enemies or um, a percentage of the enemies drop a magic um, thing that you gather. And if you have to gather them in a correct order, um, you know, using the same color shots uh, in order to then cast a spell. And then that spell will affect the board in different ways. Um, and especially like bonus levels and stuff will be like, you have to cast these three spells in a row, which means not only do you have to defeat the enemies, you have to defeat them in a certain order. And, um, that really requires two players working well together because it's the same, it's the same magic pool for both players. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where, again, the, uh, the communication comes in. So 
And uh, there's bonus levels that that crank that up, and they're like they're more set. Like the enemies aren't coming; they're just already on the board, and you just have to defeat them. And it, like it's more of a puzzle than it is action. Um, and those if you, those bonus levels require a certain amount of stars, which you get by not only doing the primary goal, but two secondary goals that are you know also detailed in the beginning of the stage. Which, by the way, for the first few stages, is just like be awesome or be strong. You know, they're just <laughs> gimmies. <laughs> Which I love that this game is so supportive of the player. Like, uh, the end of the ending credits actually says, don't forget to wash your hands and drink water. <laughs> and uh, and then that's another thing, is that I really love that this game, because it's color-based, it's extremely accessible on um, color blindness. It has eight different options oh. that are like, yeah, that are specifically named like for different types of color blindness so that people can play this game regardless of their, their acuity. Um, there you go, Cole. Accessibility. Yeah. That's my oh, shit. Yeah, however, <laughs> the the thing that I wish that was here, as a person, like, this, I'm definitely keeping this in my back pocket for the next time I'm able to play video games with people, because I always like to keep a lookout for good cooperative multiplayer games, um, but for one player, I kind of would have liked it if there was some way, just like, there's already three controller options um, that have to do with the Joy-Cons, if there was a way that they could make it where you can control both witches without switching, like use both sticks or something like that, then I would have been like perfectly happy with this as it stands. It's a very solid action uh, thing with a unique idea and lots and lots of love. Um, everything from the art to the way the game communicates with the player to like the story, like everything about this game is like really like chipper and supportive and just sounds wholesome. It's, it's very wholesome. That's a good way to describe this game. Well, 13 bucks. What do you say? If you have a friend <laughs> in these trying times, then absolutely buy it. If you are by yourself, I recommend um, checking it out and like making sure that it's something you can hang with because you aren't going to get very far if you're not very good at like managing multiple players by yourself. So, and the computer's worthless, so Teach don't the don't cats try to rely on how to fucking play. All right, <laughs> hear that, Cole Train? You got to learn how to play Xbox or no Switch? Not on Xbox Switch. Yeah, it's on Switch. Yeah. All right, something that is on Xbox. Next game to talk about is Crypto by Paugi, developed and published by Lightwood Games, released March 19th on Xbox One for $7.99. Crypto by Paugi is a classic cryptogram puzzle where a famous quote has been encoded using substitution cipher. Each letter of the alphabet has been replaced with a different letter, and you're challenged to decode it using deduction and logical thinking. Cole, that pretty much explains the whole game, so tell us what you think of it. Yeah, that's that's basically it. Um, it's great. It can be a little difficult to get your footing in the game and like figure out what the um, what the quote that you're trying to solve actually is. My my strategy tends to be like find a two letter word <laughs> or find the letter I. Mm -hmm. if, it, if the word I is somewhere in there, then you've already like filled in a third of the. A third of the puzzle. I or A. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're like nailing it. <laughs> um the the way that you play is basically the screen is broken down into into thirds. One third has your puzzle, one third has um the letters that you're trying to solve for, and the top third has your letters you can solve with. I like that everything is broken down to try to make things a little easier for you while still maintaining the difficulty of the puzzles. Um, for example, if, if there is no letter A to solve for, then the box where you choose which letter you're trying to solve for will have a dot under the A and you can't choose it to try to fill in anything for it. So that helps narrow down so you're not sitting there trying to guess a letter that's not even in the puzzle. <laughs> um, likewise, when you do fill in a letter, it go it it solves for it, so it like puts it in underneath it. So if you do fuck up and you're like, "Oh no, I put in an S and it should have been a C," then you don't have to go into the puzzle and change it bit by bit. You just correct it. Um, in that one box set of boxes and it will correct that all of the, the S's or C's, whichever one you fucked up <laughs> in the puzzle for you. 
Um, so it makes it, it makes it very simple to play it because a game like this, <laughs> the, these Palki games were like, I'm pretty sure they were mobile first, weren't, weren't they? And so you can, or maybe switch. Either way, you can tell there's like some intention for touch controls and you lose that when you're playing on Xbox. But the way that they've set it up doesn't make it feel like you've lost any functionality. No. Yeah. It definitely still, plays and is binded well to the controller they were on vita a lot too i think they're vita. i think they're just now stopping releasing on vita because nothing's releasing on vita anymore but they're starting to we'll release on ps5 that. yeah well oh, we'll good. talk about why nothing's releasing on vita anymore on thursday yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one is optimized for the Series X and S. So, what kind of graphical horsepower is in this baby? <laughs> what? It's literally just a black white screen. I don't know what's fucking talking about. I know. I love that games like this have the optimized for Series X tag. Like, yeah, what was that one? When it rattled like a, when it rattle like a, that had that deep ones game that looked like a lap rat, and they were like, it's optimized for the <laughs> one X, and you're like, fucking how? <laughs> What's optimized? <laughs> it, it doesn't need any fancy graphics or anything, any special <laughs> effects. It's it's a fucking cryptograph. Yeah. It's, what it's what else a, do you need? And there's a lot of them. There's like, what, 180? Three, no, and then like 310 or something like that. There's an insane there's amount. A lot. I feel like there's because there's at I'm least going off 12 the store pages. Page. Is it really? God, yeah, I swear to God, I saw it said 300. But now there's going to be some you don't want to fill out. I feel a little weird about a game that puts a quote from Jeffrey Star alongside a quote from the Dalai Lama. <laughs> On one hand, it's like. That's some that's some range right there. The if you like somebody, there's probably a quote from them. But also, I mean, really, Jeffrey Star. <laughs> um, there's a few odd ones to go to, and I just skipped them. I was like, I don't need to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that like you them. only went for the ones with achievements. <laughs> no, actually, I played a couple others. There was um. Shit, there was one in particular, and I like I meant to write it down, but I was like, I know he's gonna say I only played the one for achievements, and there was this, <laughs> these other ones that I had played, and I don't remember what it was now. There was one anyway, other one I played. I swear it wasn't was one all I just didn't get achievements. An for. No, no, no. There were there are actually quite a few, and it was me and number one were playing it and solving them together, and we were just kick back and and having a good time trying to figure out what they were achievements be damned well, uh, i didn't get the completion because that's a thing you can do but <laughs> <laughs> well eight bucks on this one what do you think of it i give it a buy it i really like these games i, I wish there were more of them well they're working on bringing more to xbox so good. lightwood is is going to be bringing some more over in between their multi-platform releases that hit everything <laughs> Yeah, they said it took a while, but things are finally in motion, and it looks like we'll be getting more Lightwood games and more Palky games. I, I love Yay. these these Palky games at like 3 a.m. when I'm just sitting here with my feet up and I can't sleep, and you can only shoot <laughs> so many people in the head in Call of Duty before you just kind of need a palate cleanser. Yeah. All right, well, next game to talk about is called Barrage Fantasia, developed and published by Hanaji Games, released March 25th on Switch and Steam for $9.99. A girl named Herb, who claims to be a great witch, lives in a poisonous swamp on the outskirts of a faraway country. One day, a red jewel is stolen from under a shrine, from a shrine under her control. She escapes the swamp for the first time in order to recover her jewels. Chris, tell us about Barrage Fantasia. Okay, let me just unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Barrage Fantasia. Okay, this is a vertical shmup. Now, if you don't know what a shmup is, may I <laughs> okay. direct you to the game Beaker, Unlo uh, Beaker Unloaded, yeah, which will explain it for you if you start the game. Is that a so. Muppet game? No, it's a, it's a B-based shmup, but um, it has a tutorial at the beginning of the game that explains what a shoot 'em up is. <laughs> that sounds awesome in so yeah. way. Yeah, I bought it at some point and I was like, oh, this is valuable. <laughs> Anyways. 
So yes, Barrage Fantasia is in the uh, is in the vertical category there. Now you play as an adorable witch. Um, I assume her name is Barrage. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, her name is given, but I don't remember it now. And basically, uh, things transpire, and she has to vertically shoot up words to to get him back. Um, so this game is really interesting because it's technically in the bullet hell genre. Um, so you play as, you know, a, your ship, of course, is a witch on a broom, but, you know, you can see that there's this little dot in the center. That's your actual hitbox. Mm. Um, you, so you got that nice, small, visible hitbox, and you must protect that hitbox against, uh, you know, enemies that can fill up the whole screen with bullets, big fluffy bullets, which, um, you know, are either really fast or really slow or, you know, just all kinds of arrays of like, you know, things going on. So it's that kind of game, which is my favorite, by the way. So really, uh, really enjoy this one off the bat. Now, um, what's really cool about this one now, it doesn't have like it has like a simple arcade mode, um, which has you play through five levels, um, you know, with a mini boss and a boss throughout. Uh, then there's short, which just lets you play one level at a time, um, if you want. And then, you know, you can do like a training thing or, you know, whatever. Um, so it's not like there's not a ton of content in the game. However, um, if you play through the arcade mode enough, you start to unlock all these different things. So you can unlock, um, different i guess you could you could call them familiars so it's like everything from like a uh like a dragon or a flower or you know a ghost you can have a ghost friend and um they will supplement your shooting with the shooting of their own either like one of them could serve as like a spread shot one of them can be like a much more powerful but direct attack um the flower one actually like is a charge attack that can charge up like a big bomb that really works out and um so you can like kind of experiment with playing with all those and it also gives you like different um screen clearing potions which you know in in shmup you know nomenclature is a bomb uh those are limited of course and you get more of them through gameplay um and then you can also like choose kind of like your life and barrier and um amount of potions loadout um you can you know go into safety mode which just has them all full as soon as you get into the game, or you can like make it much harder on yourself by only having like maybe one life and, you know, three bombs and that's it. And, um, you know, you have to earn the rest through gameplay. It doesn't really seem to affect, um, anything in the game, like the amount of score you get or whatever. It's just there for challenge. And, um, so in that sense, it's like, it's not a long game or anything like that, but it is very fun. Uh, it moves really well. And I really, you know, the graphic style of it is very um, 16-bit. Like, it actually looks like a Turbo Graphics game to me, and it definitely sounds like one. Like, the soundtrack is very evocative of the TG-16. So, um, it's, like, it's really interesting to see a bullet hell that runs fast and yet has these, like, kind of graphics. You know, we're, like, we're more used to seeing them uh, look a lot more modern, at least, like, PlayStation era. Nah. So, it's kind of, that pixel style is really, I think, working for it. Um, I really like the way the game looks. And again, it doesn't affect the gameplay, which is great. Um, and then finally, of course, uh, and you know, this, there's a, a slight weakness to it. And I think that that's the fact that it uses these big sprites, um, on a vertical shmup that takes up one third of the screen means that there's not a lot of game you can see. <laughs> um, but it does have the, uh, Tate mode or Tate or however you want to, T A T E, you know. I, where I you just say Tate it. mode. I'm sure it's. I wrong. say Tate. I Tate. I say Tate too. But I've heard people like Tate. Pronounce it. Yeah, Tate. So it's got a Tate mode where you can uh, turn the switch or your t- entire TV um, up on its side and then play Let's it that turn way. Your TVs. <laughs> and um, that actually that makes it look a lot cooler. And so I think that the best way to play this, if you have a flip grip, which those are this cheap accessory that lets you put your switch up on its side, but still connect your joy cons to either side and play it that way. Um, that would be the ideal situation for this, but yeah, it's, um, again, it's a little short, but it is, I mean, it's literally got short right there in the menu. Yeah. But, um, I really like this one. So cool. So 10 bucks, your verdict. Yeah. 10 bucks. Buy it. (laughs) I mean, it is, I wouldn't 
I, I would hesitate if it was any more expensive than that, but it is a solid $10 experience for shooter fans. So I say go get it. Cool. All yeah. right. Next up is Explosion Aid, developed and published by Mommy's Best Games, released March 18th on Xbox One, Switch, PS4, and PS5 for $5.99. Pilot an experimental mech and shoot giant grenades to blow up sneaky aliens, stomp their guts, destroy their base, and save the day. Cole, tell us about Explosion Aid since you weren't here for the interview. <laughs> what? I can't hear you. My audio stuttered. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Explosion Aid's supposed to be a 2D shoot 'em platformer. And that's all well and good, except for I found that I far preferred to step on the enemies to <laughs> shoot them. I, I just, everyone I ran into, I was like, can I step on it? And then I could, and then it splat, and I carried on. Um, there's around 60 or so levels in the game. I, I, I feel like the levels are a little short, and that I was blowing through them way quicker than I should have been able to. Especially when I realized that if I was particularly not interested or giving a fuck to actually clear level, I could just go straight to the exit, shoot it, and go through and not even fuck with any of the enemies. Um, there were a few I did that way. One of them I did on accident. <laughs> only because I was, it was just like the exit was very close to where you started. And I'm one of those people that just randomly shoots the moment I, I'm like, before I even start, I'm already holding the shoot button, and and it, so I just drop straight. And <laughs> I think I took maybe two steps in the whole level and, and hit the exit. And then I was like, oh. <laughs> um, that said, if you want a challenge and you actually like want to get achievements in the game, you should probably clear everything. There, there are definitely achievements for clearing all that shit. On extra difficulties, I will fucking never. Um, <laughs> But I was I was surprised at how easy it could be done on the lower difficulties. Yeah, Nathan made a point as saying that it is an easier game yeah. in general. It's actually harder than the original version was because it was wow. too easy. So even even the easiest mode on here, he said, is just it's stupidly easy. I'm not. I don't. It's think just a chill such game. A thing. I don't think there's such a thing as too easy. <laughs> But I know that while I'm cool with that, there's a lot of other people who'd be like, oh, my God, why is it so easy? I want a challenge. Well, your challenge <laughs> is clear shit. and Don't be a bitch and go straight for the exit like I did. Um, <laughs> uh, I had a good time with the game, though. Like, it was just it was one of those where, again, I could play it late at night while I had my feet up. I didn't have to put any effort into it. It was just go into a level, shoot shit. There are a few extra little quirks to the game. Um, you guys probably talked about it during the interview, but like you can hold your shield and do some bouncing around yep. and, and that kind of stuff was really impressive. Uh, I'm easy to impress, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I thought it was, was a fun little quirk. Um, I, I'm not a fan of the controller bindings from their default standings. There's a few that I kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can rebind them, so I don't feel fair like bitching about it because I was able to go in and fix it. Yeah. Um. So I don't. I don't knock. I don't do knock default binding unless I'm stuck with it. <laughs> um. But beyond that, it's just it's it's a retro inspired game that doesn't have the retro inspired difficulty, and I'm a fan of it. And the best part, it's only six dollars. So for six it, bucks, what do you think of Explosion A DX? I it, this is one of those where I'd be like, "Fuck it, why not?" But it's good enough to justify it to buy it. Yeah, I can agree with that one. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I know Jacob enjoyed it as well. Uh, ah, fuck him. <laughs> it's just it's just a solid fun game, and I can't wait to see what uh, Nathan and his crew are working on next. And if you want to hear more about Explosion Aid DX, go check out the last episode, which was my birthday episode that Cole missed out on. Uh-huh. We had mm. cake. <laughs> I ain't getting no cake. Because <laughs> you weren't here. Even if I was, I wouldn't have got no cake. How do you know? Because uh, how many miles? <laughs> he could have had that planned out. 
No, he couldn't have. I'll tell you what, because my buddy sent me a Mardi Gras king cake because we were going to do a virtual Mardi Gras, and that shit never made it. I'm pretty sure I the just like that you had it out for that statement. Huh? Uh huh. <laughs> like, I planned ahead, Purnell. Don't try this. No. I'm okay. still, every time I watch FedEx go up the road to the neighbors, I get mad because I'm pretty sure that guy ate my cake. That son of a bitch. I also Aki said this. I didn't get any cake either, and she was here. <laughs> yeah, I ate all the cake. Fuck all of y'all. I'm, I'm going to go on a mm. tiny little tangent, too. Ready? It's oh, quick. No. The UPS guy, every time he comes, he brings the treat dog treats to Dean. And the last time the FedEx guy was here... I went outside and like he was climbing into the truck as fast as he could and he was pointing at Dean with a shaky hand and he said, that dog hates me. He chased me all around this truck. And I'm like, Dean has resting happy face. I don't understand how anybody could think he was chasing them. And all I can figure out is that this has been a long game from the UPS guy. And he's, like, been giving Dean treats so that Dean would expect them from delivery guys and purposely scare the FedEx driver. Honk. That's my, I don't know who honks. Maybe somebody's got a FedEx delivery. <laughs> Where was that honk? Like, whose microphone was that, that honk on? That had to be for now. Cause that Why had to be big? Because well, you want to Might have been me. I live at, in some apartments, and apartments have the shittiest people. <laughs> it they, Cole they tells they a FedEx story in a random or, car honk. <laughs> right? Are they <laughs> FedEx drivers who are afraid of a dog with resting happy face? Oh my god. Alright, we're two away. We gotta get back to this. <laughs> Next game to talk about is Mage Drops, developed by Orchid of Redemption, published by Lamplight Forest. Those are some great names. Uh, release March 20th on Steam Early Access for $9.99 with a full release plan for August. Mage Drops is a magical golf-like platformer. It combines traditional golf and mini golf with elements of puzzle platforming and a twist of fantasy. Chris, tell us about your time with Mage Drops. <laughs> All right, well, we'll make this a little short, I think, because it's fairly straightforward. Uh, you are uh, a ghost, and you're playing golf, and uh, it's a very simplified golf game. For one thing, it is side-scrolling, so you don't aim the ball left or right. You only aim it up and down, and uh, that is to say you kind of control the trajectory with one of the sticks, because I could not... I couldn't handle the keyboard control. So I just used, you know, my controller. Yeah. Um, so, and your goal is of course, to get the ball in a hole, um, which is to say, you just have to get the ball in proximity of the hole. The hole is giant. <laughs> you just have to get it there uh, because you have to go up like platforms and like, sometimes they're moving platforms and things like that. And you're on a timer. Um, you also, of course, like golf have a, a stroke counter and, you know, they're basically, there's a lot of like levels where you're actually expected to just get it there in one shot. Um, on top of controlling the trajectory, you also control the spin of the ball. That is literally, you can put the brakes on or like keep a ball rolling after it hits the ground and like slowly make your way towards the hole if you didn't get it. Um, and yeah, like there's not even like a way to control the strength of your swing. Like it's literally, you just, aim a ball um and then you know try to get to the hole like by whacking it now you can adjust the strength you can yeah how do you do that and i it's either up or down but like you tilt back and forth to, to change the direct it's it didn't feel like i was changing the power I, it felt more like it was just the trajectory of it but yeah, it, it was the, the actual power moving up and down too Right. Uh, yeah, that's how it, you know, if you move the it's trajectory where it moves the ball forward, yes, that then he hits it harder. What I mean is, like, in your typical golf game, you have, like, a little counter that, like, when you go to swing, it, like, it moves like a little thing, and you're yeah. supposed to, like, time it correctly to get the most powerful swing. I'm just saying that that, that aspect Yeah, of they it don't is, have that three-click system that some golf games do, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like golf on the Game Boy, <laughs> which I've been playing lately. 51st best... I was going to say, I heard that's one of the best video games ever. Yeah, yeah. it's it. In uh, According to a 1997, the 100th issue of <laughs> Nintendo Power, when they rated their top 100 games in 1997, uh, it got number 51, and Earthbound got number 60. That's some bullshit. It's nine places better than Earthbound. That is some it's, bullshit. It's better than Mega Man X. <laughs> well, <sighs> on the Game Boy, folks. 
Come on, yeah, Nintendo Power. But yeah, Mage Drops. What do you think of Mage Drops? I like it. It uh, it does not hold up as a golf game whatsoever. However, it's fun and it has that one more stage hook to it. Um, there's also collectibles that you can get. I have no idea what happens if you get them because there's a hundred of them. Um, but it does have a collectibles aspect to it. Um, other than that, I mean, it's very limited on options and things like that. And like the game tells you nothing. So what I like about it is that I just wanted to keep going with it. And, uh, and that's good enough for me. Yeah. Well, right now you can get in on mage drops on steam early access for 10 bucks. They said the price will go up during development. And then when it hits final release, it will go up as well. So is it a good idea for people to jump in on this at 10 bucks or should people wait? What do you think? I think so. I'd like to know where else they plan to go with it. Um, but as it stands, it's not a bad $10 purchase. I, I will just have to see what they do with it later to see if the price hike is justified. But right now, yeah, this is something I would spend $10 on and not feel, you know, short shorted. <laughs> cool. Uh, they are saying that they plan on working for the music for the full game. They're looking for a composer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the music's a little, yeah, it's a, a little more beautiful and cohesive music and sound world is what their composer will be doing. So they're going to improve Ooh, wow. the music in the game. They're going to work on the story in the game. Uh, they're probably going to add more game, but again, the the price will go up. So for ten bucks, I I can agree that it's probably worth jumping in now. Yeah. Before the price goes as up. It, as it stands right now, it's like my new newly acquired game, Urban Street Fighting by PixArts. <laughs> uh, it's it's one of the features is optional musics. <laughs> so that's what it has right now. There you go. All <laughs> right. One final game to talk about tonight is a preview of MotoGP 2021 developed and published by Milestone. It's releasing April 22nd on Xbox One, Series X, PS4, PS5, Switch, Steam, and Epic Game Store. Uh, Pernell, tell us about your, your preview time with MotoGP. The sad thing about my preview time with MotoGP is I totally recorded myself talking about it. Just in case I would forget stuff and then never took the time to listen to my recording of it. I am so, so proud of you. Times. No, you're <laughs> not. But, well, I guess so. Yeah. Cause man, the way to fuck that up. For now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, but I'll do my best with what I can remember since it's a preview. I can get away with that suckers. Um, so from what I recall of this preview, what it allowed you to do was a few like light stuff that you could do in the game. So the most basic and entry level aspect of it was it lets you dabble a bit in the customization of things. So um, your biker, it, it's, it's insane what the customization options are for this game as far as like your biker goes. You can customize their outfit, whether it be like the stickers on the outfit. Or like if you choose like a, a overall outfit fit relates to like a team or like a company that sponsors you or something, you can choose like outfits based off of that. Um, you can customize your bike helmet with stickers and the like in different colors. Your bike itself, you can customize the look of it and also its performance in areas too, like various like bikes and then the parts and stuff like that as well. And you can even like kind of choose like a riding partner, like from a team. Oh, cat! Um, like. <laughs> Like a riding partner, not like far as like your team goes, like because there's like a weird set of team that you can choose from, and they seem to span the franchise because it was like when you would pick them it was like MotoGP, MotoGP two, MotoGP three, and a couple others. You couldn't select all of them. I guess the others were locked out because of the preview, but you could select from at least two or three of them. And it was like a list of different bikers and the teams they from the cities, they're, the countries they're from and the teams they ride for. Yeah. I'm guessing um, they were the different leagues. That would make sense. Okay. Yeah, Cause like, so you do that aspect of things. And uh, so that was all the customization. And as far as the main riding goes, they gave you access to time trials, in which case that you, you ride on like eight out of like the 20 tracks that were of it are going to ultimately be available in the game. Unless there's something that weren't even visible on the screen. Um, and also there was the ability to do like an actual like weekend run. So I'm not used to this in a racing game. I'm guessing maybe the older motor GPs did it too, or maybe this is new. I don't freaking know. But what would happen is you would like say sign up for like a competition, right? And the competition would take place over a series of days. Now, when you go and select it and you choose it, you would then eventually get access to like a calendar. So let's say, for example, it was a weekend event, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. 
you'd have a couple of blocks of events that are set up and you can choose which ones to engage in. So, for example, a Friday, there would be two practice races, each lasting 45 minutes. And it's 45 minutes of real time. So once you start driving, the clock will start. And even if you like, you know, stop your bike, like go like a pits or something like that, it's going to keep counting down. So and when it's done, it's done. Um, and you're basically trying to get like a fast lap time as you're doing this. Um, and then the next day you might have two more practice runs available and then two qualifiers. The perk to the practice runs, aside from just getting practice and learning the layout of the track, is that if you get a really good time on one of those days, you're given the option to skip the first qualifier event and go right to the second qualifier. So it's kind of nice to get practicing at the same time, save yourself the stress of trying to qualify for the race, at least for the first round of it. And then the final day being Sunday, you might get like one more opportunity to practice and then the final run. So the reasons why you would want to practice are a few reasons. One, again, get the lay of the track itself. Two, the aforementioned, you know, qualifier skip. And finally, you might find yourself, you know, thinking, hey, based on how I rode on this course, I might want to tune my bike in a way that lets me better handle these curves or something like that. Um, so it, allows, it gives you the opportunity to kind of like plan ahead and like speculate. If you didn't get a handle of it by now, you will shortly anyway. But nonetheless, I'm pointing out in this statement, this is a sim, not an arcade racer. Uh, and while I had no complaints about how the bike handled, that doesn't mean I was good at handling the bike. Uh, I fucking suck at this game. Uh, I just want to point that out. I, I got to say that is a running theme of all of us who have tried these games. Like we're all just terrible at these Moto GP games. Like, like after, I don't know what it is. Like, I don't know what it is about this deal. Like, I guess they expect you to like borderline slam on the damn brakes before every turn or something. I don't know, but I try to take the turns in the way that I see like all the other characters are doing it. And my guy would just like flip over. Like it'll just tip off the bike. Um, Bikers have crashed into me and taken me off of my bike. Yep, I was just going to ask if the, if the AI were dickheads in this game running you off the road. Oh, they I got wrecked a couple of times. Though on the positive, some of those wrecks, it was a dual wreck. Like, they hit me, and they didn't come away unscathed. We both hit the bike. But uh, <laughs> I guess it's realistic in its own way because all the mistakes won't be yours alone, right? But it still sucks. You think you're doing a good job. And all of a sudden, bam, somebody just slams it to you from the back. And it's like, well, here's the slow motion of this guy eating paint. It's terrible. Um, but when, uh, despite the fact that I personally suck at it, I don't think that's the game's fault. The handling of the bike is pretty sound. Uh, and it, it was uh, when I was hitting the brakes, it was doing a good job of hitting the brakes. I got the decent feedback on that. Both the acceleration and the braking, it was good feedback for it. Uh, I do like that. It, I'm not. Sh- I do like that. It gives you like kind of the line to kind of prep your turn too. So like you know how it does a little bit like green for g- accelerate and then yellow to red for like decelerate. It is stop. Slow as you're down. Going ease up. Now again, that doesn't mean that I can read that line and, uh, and act on it appropriately. <laughs> just that it exists for people who don't suck and can act on that line. It's there for you, not for me. Uh, but. And also, this is a thing for Sims too, and I acknowledge that this is a thing that I guess these guys, everyone likes that I don't. I they should have music. I, I I can't stand driving on these races and it's fucking silent. Yeah, it's nice to hear your bike, but guess what? I can hear bikes. I can hear the bike on over the music while I'm driving too. Like throw something in there. Just even a guy playing the fucking fiddle. Just. <laughs> Just give me some noise. <laughs> I would write. I would race to that. <laughs> I would race to all those sounds, but because they all beat silence, I'm not. I'm not that guy. I'm not the guy that's going to go out and bust out Spotify to play while I'm racing the game. Like no, I'm playing the game, which means my speakers and my ears are going to the game right now, not two sound sources at once. I'm not that person. Um. But I'm sure they're hearing this and go, whatever, guys, work for the past three other games. We're going to do this one, too. And they're right to do so. But I also think they're wrong to do so. Um, but as a preview of the game, I do believe there's going to be a fair bit of, like, I think it's going to be a good game. Like, I, I don't foresee it being bad. I like the idea that there's, like, decent weather effects that are available in the game. 
I like the handling of the game, even though I suck at the actual handling itself. I like the idea of the whole weekend scheduling, but it also means that those events can run long if you try to do every event. Yeah. <laughs> but I but mean, for again, the, the, the realists stamp. out there that want to do everything, it's there. Yes, it is. You'll be geeked over that bike tweaking and joining different teams and sponsoring yourself. It's a good. Pre- I got to add a good preview out of it. I think they. I think, I think they won't be disappointed in the final product. Cool. Sounds good. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. Uh, made it through another one. We did it. Did yeah, no under hurricane. two hours. I'm amazed. Speed Baby, you're chat. amazed. Outstanding. Yeah, twelve reviews in under two hours. I'm. I'm proud of y'all. You did me proud. Um, Where's the cake? The, I <laughs> there. I ate it. It's gone. 